Everyone's heard of the big Docker containers, but there are tons of smaller, underrated containers that can completely change your home lab. In this video, I'll share five Docker containers that don't always get the spotlight, but are incredibly useful once you start running them. The first is a tool called Sterling PDF. Now, most people who need to edit PDF files use something like Adobe Acrobat, which means that on every single device, you have to go through and not only purchase it, but install it. Now, that's not always the best case for home users. So instead, what you can do is use Sterling PDF, which is self-hostable, and you can basically run it right inside of Docker. This is also helpful because you don't always have to edit PDF files. It's something that a lot of people do rarely. So in situations like that, that's where Sterling PDF comes in. You can merge PDFs, split, reorder, rotate, compress, extract, convert, sign. It's super easy to self-host with Docker Compose. Everything stays local, meaning that everything is private. And for sensitive documents, you don't have to worry about it being uploaded to any third-party servers. Everything is fast because it's all local. And overall, it just works very well. Configure Sterling PDF, access it through a web browser, and you'll be able to do just about everything that you have to. The next is a tool called Bezel. Now, server monitoring is something that most people don't actually do. What they really do is uptime monitoring. So using something like Uptime Kuma as an example, what you're doing is you're monitoring that a service stays online or goes offline. Now, that doesn't really help with situations where you have to monitor the CPU usage or memory or the disk space. And that's where a tool like Bezel comes in. Now, most people go and try to set up something super complicated with a complicated dashboard that's super customized. And that's a great thing to have. And it's nice to do. But the goal here is monitoring. And that's what Bezel does. It will monitor your servers. And that's what we're looking for. It works as a hub and spoke model, meaning that you install the application inside of Docker. Then you can add a system to it copy the install command, and you can configure the agent on the system you'd like to monitor. After you do that, the system will appear inside of Bezel, and at that point, you can view some fancy dashboards if you want to. But again, the goal here is monitoring. So what we're really looking to do is configure notifications. When you go to configure those notifications, not only will you receive notifications if the system goes down, which is obviously important to have, but you'll also receive notifications based on whatever you specify for the system. So if you want to monitor CPU usage or memory usage and ensure that it doesn't go over a specified limit for a specified time period, you can. Overall, monitoring is boring to a lot of people. And that's why I'm saying that you don't need to spend a ton of time configuring a super complex monitoring system. Configure something like Bezel, monitor your servers and services, and you'll know if something goes wrong. I wanna be clear that this is not the only tool that you have to use. And while I brought up Uptime Kuma earlier, I use it as well, and I use both of them. They're both super easy to set up, and I have a video showcasing both of them. If you're interested in doing that, I'll leave a link to that in the description. But I wanna be clear that Bezel does what Uptime Kuma does, kind of from an uptime monitoring perspective, but it also does more from the perspective that you're monitoring the server itself. The next is a tool called Authentic, and I just did a video on this recently. Now, single sign-on is another somewhat boring topic to a lot of people, but it has huge benefits. The biggest one is basically that you secure one account and then you can log into multiple services. Now, why this is important is because what that allows you to do is configure one account that has a strong password with two-factor authentication, and then you're able to access all of the services using that one account. Now, obviously, you have to go in and configure those services. So it's not something that can be done for absolutely everything. But if the service supports it, meaning that it supports an identity provider like Authentic, you can go in and configure that service, and then at that point, you can sign in with your individual user account. I've done this for Proxmox, Proxmox backup server. You can set it up with Portainer. There are a ton of different services that you can use. And after you configure those with Authentic, your Authentic user account can be used to sign into them. Where people get lost with identity providers is that they view them as super complex to set up and configure. 
That's not really the case. Authentic has a great knowledge base, and if it has your application listed, you basically just have to follow the instructions, and then you can configure your service to work with Authentic. The point really is that once you set up and start to use something like Authentic, it's going to be pretty annoying when you have to sign into individual services. And it's something that you'll notice right away and you'll hope that those services one day support an identity provider like Authentic because it just simplifies the entire process and increases security at the same time. The next is a tool that I just recently started using and it's Link Warden. Now, Link Warden is really a favorites tracker or bookmark tracker. And the reality is that the majority of people use their browser for this. So what you do is you access a website, you go in, you save a favorite, and then you access it through your favorites bar and that favorite gets synced to all of your devices where you sign into your user account and it works and it works well. Link Warden is a little different than that. So what it allows you to do is it allows you to categorize your favorites. So from a browser perspective, you're really only able to categorize your favorites with folders. So you can create different folders for the type of favorite, but you can't categorize it inside of a collection or with tags. And that's what Link Warden allows you to do. Think of a collection like a bucket for links, and then you could have tags that apply to all of your links. And then at that point, you're able to kind of narrow down based on the collection and the tag exactly what link you're trying to find. And of course, you can always search through your links as well. Overall, what this allows me to do is basically leave the bookmarks in my browser for the things that I'm accessing daily that I don't really need to categorize or I won't get any benefit out of categorizing them. But for just about everything else, anything that I access infrequently, it right now is being moved into Link Warden because it's easier for me to find them, it's better because I can categorize them, and overall, it's worked very well. And I'm in the process of migrating everything over now. And so far, I've been very happy with Link Warden. The next is Nextcloud. And there are gonna be a lot of people that are going to say that Nextcloud is absolutely not underrated, but I'm gonna tell you why I think it is. I tried to switch off Synology Drive for literally years, not because Synology Drive was not good. In fact, Synology Drive is really good but I did not like the fact that I was locked in to a vendor's operating system to access and use an application that I use every single day. Every time I searched for Synology Drive alternatives, I came across the downsides of Nextcloud. It was never really the benefits of Nextcloud, it was the downsides of Nextcloud. It's bloated, it's slow, it's overcomplicated, it's difficult to set up, and overall, it kind of pushes you away from it. The thing is, to be fair, at a point in time, Nextcloud wasn't the easiest to set up and use. But that all kind of changed with Nextcloud AIO, which is their all-in-one installer that basically manages everything for you. The all-in-one installer will basically go through and download and install all of the containers that you need to run Nextcloud. It has a backup utility that backs up all of your data on a specified schedule. It can be paired with automatic updates. So truthfully, I'm not in love with that feature, but basically when it backs up all of your data, it will run through and update all of those containers that are needed to run Nextcloud. There are a ton of add-ons, though again, I'm not really using any of them. There's one feature though, that simply put has been amazing for me, and it's the reason I loved Synology Drive for so long, and Nextcloud basically does the exact same thing. I very rarely access my data through a web browser or mobile application. So if it's slow or clunky, it's there when I need it, but it's not the main way that I'm accessing my data. The way that I access my data is with a desktop tool. The Nextcloud desktop tool has been great. It utilizes a feature called virtual files. So basically what it allows me to do is sync data to and from my device with my Nextcloud server. If I need to access and use a file, I double click it. It will then open the file and I can use it. If I save the file, it will sync it back to Nextcloud. I set this application up on every single one of my devices. And then at that point, every time I log into any of my devices, I always have the most up-to-date version of that file. And if I change it, it will then sync back to Nextcloud and all of my other devices 
will connect to Nextcloud and get the latest version as well. This is why I use Synology Drive for so long, but rather than being locked into a specific vendor's application, I am now using an open source alternative that works just as well and has the same, if not more features. Now I'm not saying that Nextcloud is the best option for everybody, and there are some valid complaints about it online. But overall, if you were like me and were kind of pushing it to the side based on everything that you read, I'd suggest that you try it out. It's worked very well for me over the course of the past few months. I've gone through multiple updates. I haven't really run into any problems. That doesn't mean I'll never run into any problems, but I've been very happy with it overall. I have a video on it if you're interested in setting it up that I will leave in the description. Now, there are a ton of different Docker containers, and there are a lot of people that are gonna say that there are a lot more underrated Docker containers, and I'd love to hear what you think in the comments. Which containers should I run that I'm not currently running? Which of these are not underrated and are popular enough to be called popular options? I'd love to hear what you think, but other than that, if you made it this far, thank you very much for watching. I'll see you guys next time.